Good morning and welcome to the seventh, I can't believe this is the seventh annual session of the Charleston Conference Long Arm of the Law. And we want to especially thank once again our guest star, Mr. Kenny Rogers. Next time we'll have everyone sing it, right? You can hide out for a while, he says with a smile, but you can't outrun the long arm of the law. Okay, folks, so uh, with those words of caution, um, I wanted to say that um, two, three weeks ago, I sent out a note on Live License Hell asking people to send me what they thought had been some of the key developments in legal issues related to libraries or publishing over the course of the year. And I got a shorter list than I expected, but I'll read it to you. Um, the Section 108 uh, meetings happening in Washington, D.C., uh, the Copyright Office at the Library of Congress, and then, of course, the recent shakeup. Um, Sci-Hub and article sharing. The Georgia State case, which seems to have more lives than a cat. Um, the American Disabilities Act and websites. And the right to be forgotten. Those are some of the items that came in. As you know, uh, the legal issues that relate to us are profuse. Uh, they're numerous and uh, ever, never change, ever changing and never ending. So what we thought we would do this time uh, would be a little bit different. We invited Mark Seeley, who is lead counsel at Elsevier, to be our first speaker here. Uh, and I, I asked him to talk about the day in the life of a legal attorney in a publishing company, a large publishing company, obviously. And he's going to do that. Uh, and then we move on from there. Uh, Mark is senior vice president and general counsel of Elsevier. He splits his time between Cambridge, Massachusetts and the Amsterdam headquarters. He leads an international team of publishing and sales lawyers. And the global rights and permissions team also reports to him. He's on the board of directors of the Copyright Clearance Center. He chairs the Copyright and Legal Affairs Committee of the International Association of STM Publishers, Science, Technology, and Medicine, and he's a member of the AAP Copyright Committee. He regularly contributes to papers on copyright issues and best practices. He's a frequent speaker on copyright. His education is Thomas Jefferson College, Grand Valley State University, Michigan, uh, for, for the uh, BPH in literature, Suffolk University Law School in Boston for the JD, and he's a member of the Massachusetts and New York bars. Our second speaker, Bill Hane, is, is known to us all. Uh, Bill is a lover of libraries, although he's an antitrust attorney. He's long loved libraries. I met him back in the early 90s when I worked at ARL. And he likes to come to Charleston, and he always composes a song for us. So I think he will not disappoint. Bill regularly represents corporations and individuals in civil and criminal matters involving federal and state antitrust law and other tr trade regulations. Excuse me. He's an adjunct professor teaching courses at IIT, Chicago Kent Law School in antitrust, intellectual property. Whoops. Sorry, <laughs> there's Bill. Uh, and is the author or editor of several books on antitrust and IP property law, including Corporate Counsel's Guide to Unfair Competition, soon to be published by Thomson Reuters West Publishing. He is a frequent lecturer at the Charleston Conference. He's active in the American Bar Association. He's currently co-chair of the Joint Editorial Committee for International Law. He served as assistant district attorney in the New York DA's office and was a law clerk for Justice Tom Clark on the U.S. Supreme Court. He's a graduate of Yale College and Georgetown University Law Center. Now, the format we're going to follow today will be a little bit different. Uh, Mark will speak first, and we will have then a few minutes after that for comments and questions to Mark because his, his presentation is, is of a, a sort of different sort than... than uh, then Bill's. And then after Bill's, we will have a chance 
for more comments and questions uh, to Bill and to both of them. So after all that palaver, uh, let me introduce Mark and thank you very much for coming. Thanks and good morning, everyone. It's actually it's my not my first time in Charleston, but it's my first time at the conference. So it's uh, it's great to be here. I have been following things on on Twitter, of course. So uh, <clears throat> I've heard a few things uh, talked about here and there in different sessions. Uh, I, although I do agree with some of the comments in the Twitter feed that it's sometimes hard to figure out which which session is which. Um, so I do tend to think of myself as a publishing lawyer, and <clears throat> uh, copyright issues are very much bread and butter uh, for me. However, I, I am a general counsel of a, of a large business, uh, which is part of an even larger business. <clears throat> and so what I thought might be interesting was to talk, of course, about copyright issues, because I can't do a presentation without talking about copyright. <clears throat> but also to talk about some of the other things uh, that we have to worry about and think about uh, in connection with uh, a general legal function at a business and a company. <clears throat> so I am going to talk a little bit about the company and the business, uh, mostly to give context for then what the legal function at such a business uh, is responsible for. <clears throat> and then I'm going to talk about my own direct responsibilities and, and wind up discussing a day in the life, although I had changed it to a week in the life uh, to give a bit more variety of issues that I was talking about. So that's what we're going to talk about. And as I mentioned, so Elsevier and Relics. <clears throat> Relics, as probably some of you will know, is the new name of the business that I knew for many years as Reed Elsevier. Um, and people have had some fun in pronouncing <clears throat> the new name. But uh, Relics is generally the way we refer to it. Uh, and of course, it's, it's a large company. That's the parent company that's a dual listed uh, entity. <laughs> Largely London and Amsterdam are the Euronext exchange, which is Paris and Amsterdam, with a little bit of stuff on the New York Stock Exchange. <clears throat> and it's a business that includes uh, four divisions, of which Elsevier is one. Uh, on the legal side, it also uh, publishes uh, in the LexisNexis space and uses that brand, and that's a, a well-known brand for lawyers. There's a large number of staff, so there's 30,000 uh, around the world. About half of those staff are here in North America. And then if we drill down a little bit more into the Elsevier business, um, it, it's a business, just thinking about the staff numbers, of about 7,000 staff. Uh, and those staff are distributed across 26 countries around the world. Big chunk in uh, North America, so that's about half of our staff are also in North America. Largely, those staff are from the health side of the business. And then we have sizable operations in, of course, Amsterdam, uh, the UK, other parts of Europe, and then we've got a scattering, of course, in sort of the rest of the world, if you will particularly uh, Asia as a de developing area. And I think everyone in this room will know Elsevier as the publisher of many journals. Um, and that's certainly an important part of our business. But even on the publishing side, we also publish uh, a fair number of books uh, and databases and the like. And then increasingly, our business is focusing on questions about analytics and services. Some of that is based on the scientific or research intensive uh, side of our business. So building on the content that we're developing uh, in terms of things like databases and how can we turn those into analytic services to help institutions look at their output of research activity. <clears throat> but also we do a fair amount on the health side, working with uh, hospitals uh, and healthcare providers and insurers to look at the effectiveness of their uh, activities. And there's a lot of uh, writing which is not exactly scientific writing, it's more about practice and medical practice. <clears throat> we also train and test uh, a large number of students. We do, what's the, uh, yeah, something like uh, 750,000 tests are done online <clears throat> every year uh, by the Elsevier business through the old Mosby uh, business or Hesse business as it's now known. 
<clears throat> so you see that there's the traditional publishing, but there's also a fair amount of new analytics. And the, the implications of that <clears throat> are that we have to do a lot of different kinds of activities, some of which are quite traditional in terms of things like the publishing contracts of one kind or the other. But we're also increasingly doing uh, distributor and agent agreements, technology and procurement uh, contracts of one kind or another. So there's a large scale of contracts here, but there's also a large scale of expertise that we're asked to provide. Uh, things about uh, procurement uh, problems, uh, compliance issues like data protection and privacy or anti-bribery uh, and the like. So my challenge is how to do that um, with the, the department that we have. Now, because of the RELICS corporate structure, we do have a central corporate legal team at the RELICS level, and they provide some centers of expertise for us in terms of mergers and acquisitions, some work in the patent area, labor and employment issues, which is incredibly important when you have 7,000 staff around the world and things like compliance and data protection and privacy. The, the Elsevier legal team uh, that I manage directly is, is 19 lawyers, and you can see that the numbers are reasonably split between the US, uh, Europe, and, and APAC. That is, there's almost as many lawyers in Europe, including the UK for the moment, uh, as there are in the US, and the US has our uh, litigation team. Uh, otherwise, if we were just looking at the business supporting lawyers, the numbers would be much more equal. And then the numbers are, are increasing in Asia as uh, the business is developing there. And we also have a sizable team of rights and permissions folks, paralegals and administrators that are part of this. So the way that we have organized ourselves is we have four teams uh, within, within the legal function. Two of those are very focused on traditional publishing, one on journals, one on books and databases. One is focused on sales issues. One is focused on technology and procurement. And we have our litigation team as well. So you could say that we have five teams all together. We have regional general counsel. So there's one regional GC uh, that really supports the European and APAC business, and one in North America. And they've got a variety of responsibilities, <coughs> including liaison with, uh, with management teams in their general areas. So generally, the way I think that any company has to look at the balance between business needs. And by, and by the way, this is true at any institution or university also, I believe. It's not really unique to businesses. <clears throat> How do you balance those needs with uh, the resources that you have? A and we think of this very much as all about triage. It's about managing the resources in an efficient and effective way and trying to think about those large numbers of contracts, for example, are there ways to do more of that online? Uh, is there more automation that's possible to be done? Or generally speaking, can we provide more tools, more self-help uh, 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 procedures, if you will, for folks in the publishing and the sales side of the business? So that's, that's really how we look at the business and how we try to help the business uh, both do things efficiently but also, through that efficiency, give us a bit of resource to help on the more strategic dimensions. So on complex negotiations, um, on sort of looking ahead and down the line in terms of some of those questions about technology and analytics. Uh, being efficient uh, means that you can do more of that work as well, which I think uh, it provides a better resource for the business and the company. So that's. Uh, a little bit about the business and a little bit about the legal department. So enough about that. Let's talk about me. Um, so these are, I have a number of key objectives, don't we all, uh, every year. The, I'm going to talk about three of mine for the year 2016. And, and I think some of them won't be surprising at all. So copyright and public policy, as I said, kind of bread and butter, uh, something I, I deal with uh, on a regular basis. Uh, uh, compliance, of course, we have to comply with uh, laws and regulations, and sadly, laws and regulations are increasing rapidly all the time, and uh, you cannot rely on the idea that the regulations are only relevant if they're in the U.S. or the U.K. or the Netherlands. 
Well, there's lots of regulations that are happening around the world, and some are uh, just as difficult and just as intense as uh, they may be in the states in Europe. Um, and I'm also going to talk a bit about the collaboration and analytics question. So in the area of compliance, uh, it's always about risk assessment, of course, uh, and providing advice and support in terms of investigations. It's always a lot about training and identifying what are the rules of practice that we're going to follow. It's easy to say that you have to comply with law around the world. It's harder, I think, to provide a, a real set of procedures and controls that we think generally ensures that the business is operating lawfully. Um, so one example that I give here is the anti-bribery uh, program. So a few years ago, the UK joined the US in having quite stringent uh, regulations on anti-bribery. And the difference between the US and the UK was that the US tends to focus on government uh, agencies of one kind or another. The UK law was, was much broader, and the UK law really required that you really sort of know the people that you're dealing with uh, in terms of distributors and agents and the like, and particularly that you have some responsibility for those entities out there that are actually acting on your behalf. So from a legal perspective, acting as an agent. So what we had to do several years ago is we had to stand up a program by which we assessed uh, the more than 100 distributors and agents. And by the way, when we started the program, we discovered that we had something like 400 distributors or agents. So part of the program was, surely we don't need to have three or 400 agents and distributors around the world. Let's focus on the key ones and really drill down. Uh, so we did a lot of this initial assessment uh, ourselves. What we decided, uh, and, and this was a lot of work for us to do, the due diligence process, of course, involves a little bit of questionnaires of the agents, but then doing some searching, uh, using some LexisNexis tools and others to see whether, in fact, uh, the, the person or the party that you're dealing with uh, seems to be uh, ethical, uh, seems to be dealing with uh, uh, their customers in an ethical way, <clears throat> and where there are no reports uh, that that agent is somehow involved in bribery or other uh, unethical issues. So, what we, the requirements under the UK law is that you do that kind of assessment on a periodic basis. <clears throat> so last year, as we were coming up on our, the renewal that we set ourselves to relook at all agents and distributors around the world, <clears throat> we decided that it would be clever to do that efficiently. We set up an industry, an independent industry bureau to conduct due diligence, and we share that uh, cost, if you will, across several publishing houses. A simple idea there is that if uh, 30 publishing houses are asking uh, one agent to fill out 30 questionnaires and then going through due diligence process, why not do it once uh, and do it more effectively? So that's an example of the kinds of issues we look at on the compliance side. I think the copyright issues, I think you, you won't be surprised uh, that there's a strong focus uh, for me and, and frankly for the entire legal department on these issues. And I think it takes, uh, it's really, it's about three dimensions. One is our internal policies. So we've always tried to look very carefully and to not be, um, uh, not to make sort of automatic uh, leaps of judgment about what's right and what might not be right. And the issues are, of course, particularly, I think, acute on the journal side of the business, where, after all, authors are looking for visibility uh, and uh, public claiming of their inventions and discoveries. Uh, and somehow the publishing world in, involved in journals has to find a way to live with that uh, desire for visibility while at the same time, particularly on the subscription side, preserving a business model. So how do you, how do you balance these things? So there's a lot of internal policy discussions that we have. But we continue to sort of manage the copyright issues, rights and permissions, clearing permissions, and the like. Even in an OA world, there's a fair amount of issues about copyright issues. For example, uh, Creative Commons licenses and all the flavors of those licenses, and which is more appropriate. We're also looking on the enforcement side. So we look at sites that are using content 
and we try to identify the best way to reach out to them. We have uh, been focusing a lot through the STM Association on a set of sharing principles, again, it's the idea of what can we support in terms of visibility uh, and balanced with a need to, to maintain a subscription business. Um, and then we're also looking to see what type of issues are going on legislatively. So what are the copyright revision efforts which are being looked at around the world? I think at the moment, this is most acute in Brussels. The European Commission just released a few weeks ago uh, a new document called the Digital Single Market. Of course, it's very much at a proposal stage. It will go through lots of changes uh, legislatively and elsewhere. Uh, and the key issue that we've been looking at here is the question of text and data mining rights as an, as a, an exception to copyright. And our key point here is to try to preserve the commercial market, which is pretty viable and which is growing nicely. Um, think about the pharmaceutical industry, for example. They're very interested in the question of text and data mining, not only of published content, but also of their own content as well. And they're looking for tools and services that help them do that. Third thing I thought I would talk about is this question about uh, collaboration and technology. As we look at our business, what we think is that the future, of course, has a strong technology focus, and to some extent the future is about what can you, what kind of answers can you provide ultimately. So it's not, it's not just about doing research. It's also about finding ways to work with technology and big data, and I know there's been lots of discussions about big data over the past couple of days. How do you provide the, the kind of combination and the collaboration of technology and content to provide better answers and better information for researchers uh, and for medical practitioners? The questions that we have as we, as we reach out to third parties to think about doing these kinds of collaboration projects, uh, some of them are, are not unusual. In almost any partnership or collaboration, you're always going to have uh, differences of view uh, between, the, between the, the respective partners as to the value that they're bringing to the party. Uh, it, so it won't be a surprise that from a content perspective, we think our, the content that we've worked on, uh, both on the science side and the health side, is pretty valuable and pretty useful. And we think that if people are devising tools uh, for research or for healthcare, that you start with content. So we think of content as sort of being king. Surprisingly, the technology vendors have a completely different view. In their view, it's all about delivery, it's all about solutions, and content is kind of a commodity. <clears throat> so there's, there's, it's easy to see how there can be collisions of interests and disagreements. So part of the exercise here is to try to figure out what kind of approach works uh, with different types of technology collaborators, <clears throat> and also to be thoughtful about questions about what types of intellectual property rights, and actually I don't think it's about IPR, I think it's about intellectual content uh, that's being thrown off as a result of these kinds of projects. <clears throat> because it's not the sort of traditional IP uh, rights that we're used to, it's probably not copyright, and it's probably not patent, um, it's definitely not trademarks, uh, and it's not trade secrets if you're going to talk about it a lot. So what is it, uh, and how do you protect it? So those are some of the key personal responsibilities for this year that I'm uh, responsible for. And then here's the kind of the final uh, part of the discussion and, and the last uh, slide here, which is the day in the life uh, issue. And for me, the, this is actually an excerpt from the week of the 3rd of October. <clears throat> now that's important because in the publishing world, uh, that means that's about two weeks away from uh, the Frankfurt Book Fair. And as probably many of you know, the Frankfurt Book Fair is one of the largest international gatherings of uh, publishers and distributors and agents and even some librarians uh, that happens around the world, although London Book Fair would uh, complain about that uh, characterization. Um, so the, the thing there is that because all the publishing houses and all the trade associations, well, many of them are meeting, that week in Frankfurt, of course there's a lot of preparation for those meetings. So what are the key issues that are being discussed in terms of copyright issues, copyright cases, copyright revision, so the whole question about text and data mining rights and the digital single market. 
uh, was critical there. Uh, so a lot of preparation, a lot of discussions within the trade associations and in uh, individual one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussions uh, with publishing houses. Uh, some related uh, discussions about technology because uh, I think as has actually been discussed quite a bit here in sessions uh, at Charleston this year, uh, there's a, a lot of issues about uh, uh, both better accessibility and better security. And, and are those two things completely in conflict, or are there ways to improve accessibility and ease of use while ensuring that security is also there? And publishing houses are, are looking at those issues as well. On the collaboration uh, side, we did an in-person workshop. I gathered uh, together some senior managers at Elsevier uh, with an external lawyer, uh, because of course, we won't have expertise in all of these areas and all these issues. And we'll always rely on outside counsel uh, to provide some particular expertise on particular points. For example, antitrust issues. Um, we, we definitely would uh, talk with outside counsel about those issues. So we did, uh, we did an in-person workshop and we tried to work through some of those questions about valuation of different assets uh, in these combinations. Uh, I had a couple of compliance issues. So uh, it surprised me to learn that if you operate an online job board uh, from the UK, that you're considered to be an employment agency. Uh, I had no idea that this was the case. Uh, it struck me as completely wrong. Uh, and what I gathered is that most online job boards that operate in the UK do not regard themselves as employment agencies. So they kind of tend to disregard it. But nonetheless, that was what the law said. <clears throat> so we had to sort of work through what the implications of that uh, were and how we could actually operate uh, the system going forward. We also had some compliance investigations in two APAC countries. Um, one was a, as a result of an internal whistleblower, one as a result of a government agency. A and here, all, all you can say is that all the training in the world and all the best practices and the code of conduct, uh, at the end of the day, uh, people may be motivated by things other uh, than the best business ethics, uh, and you do need investigations and you need, frankly, uh, penalties uh, to really ensure that a compliance program really operates and works well. Had some uh, administrative things going on as well, so we were looking at the Books Contract Automation Project, which we've been working on this year and which will be standing up uh, next year in 2017. But we also had some corporate organization questions. We had some changes in directors. We needed to look at the slate of directors for the Dutch, UK, and US entities. These are not the publicly traded entities, entities but the operating entities. Uh, and we had a discussion with our tax team about some assets that are owned by a European entity, which is no longer terribly active. And then finally, I actually did some publishing things. So I sit, uh, I'm one of three members of our retractions panel uh, inside the company that looks at journals uh, and looks at retraction and removal proposals. <clears throat> and this is often gets us involved in discussions with the external journal editors about what they're proposing, how they're proposing to do it, and to make sure that we're uh, well aligned. So that was a day in life. Thanks. I think we have a couple of uh, questions. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions or comments. Does anybody have anything at this time? I, I kind of want to ask, uh, in this huge panoply of issues, uh, how much attention is occupied by libraries? Well, um, we have got a group that really works with uh, library organizations and associations on a regular basis. They tend to reach out to me when there are specific questions that are coming up. Um, and so I do get involved in some of those questions. Uh, so they often raise questions, for example, about interlibrary loan and such matters. Um, but I, I'm not working directly myself personally on those matters. And then, of course, uh, half of our sales uh, program is, is obviously focused on libraries and universities. So there's a lot of issues there in terms of negotiations and sales processes. And as you know, we're, we're doing a lot of uh, large-scale national uh, deals at the moment. So we sort of did the Dutch deal a while ago. We just uh, 
JISC and us were just announced uh, a couple of days ago that we reached a deal in the UK. Well, I, I don't want to monopolize this, but I was wondering, <coughs> excuse me, um, I was wondering how much autonomy there is on the sales and marketing side when it comes to negotiations and at what point do they have to refer back up to legal? Because I think in my experience, which is not entirely recent anymore, uh, we would come to a lot of instances where we were told that <clears throat> we have to consult with Amsterdam. And I was wondering when that happens. Yeah. So uh, often the salespeople will say, oh, they have to consult with legal. What they really meant is they have to consult with strategy and, and policy. Um, yeah. Because <clears throat> as we were talking about uh, uh, before the meeting, um, people have no memory of anything. So uh, <clears throat> one of the functions of the legal department that I forgot to mention was that we actually remember a fair amount about why we made a particular decision, why we do this, why we don't that. Uh, so uh, we tend to be the corporate memory. Um, but it's often these are questions of strategy and policy, of course. Um, yes, go ahead. Um, uh, Barbara Ferry from Smithsonian Libraries. I'm wondering if you could go a little more in depth about um, how the publishers are handling the Sci-Hub um, issues and how you see that playing out. I wish I knew. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's very difficult when when dealing with uh, a, an international organization and thinking about where, uh, for example, legal action would be mo would be most effective. Um, Sci-Hub might suggest that legal action in Russia or perhaps Kazakhstan or some other place like that <laughs> would be the right place to bring a legal action. Um, I don't think we're quite convinced that that really is going to work or, or be particularly meaningful. So I, I think, as is often true, I think it has to be a multi-layered approach. I do think that collectively we have to work on this question about accessibility and security. Uh, and that obviously is a long-term approach and has to do with our uh, reliance on IP addresses alone, uh, which comes from the 1990s. <clears throat> and we need to work on that collectively. Um, and then, are we looking at ways to put pressure on Sci-Hub site? Yes, of course we are. Uh, and by the way, Sci-Hub is not just about journals, but the LibGen site particularly is about books. Uh, and there we get a lot of pressure from our authors and book publishers as well to do more on that score. Thank you, Mark. Um, we can come back to some of these issues later, but let me turn this over to Bill for his annual update on key issues facing libraries and publishers. So I think this is, since I, uh, last time I played Yankee Stadium, this is probably the widest audience I've ever <laughs> spoken to, which uh, creates problems. I got a little stiffness in the neck. so. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, um, I've got four parts to my speech, so I'm going to address the first part <laughs> to the people over there. Now, when I look over there, I want you to sit up a little straighter, look me in the eye, and we'll maintain a little visual communication. And then the second part, I will address to you all, the third part to you, the fourth part to you, and then the rest, I'm going to talk to the cameraman. <laughs> so... Um, <clears throat> I want to talk first about the right to be forgotten. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about this uh, in 2014 uh, when the European Court of Justice handed down the ruling in the Google, what's referred to now as the Google Spain case. Uh, an action had been brought before a data protection organization in Spain uh, which ruled that the individual who had brought the complaint um, a man who probably was trying to get a little privacy into his life, but whose name is now on every website <laughs> throughout the world, uh, Senor Mario Casteja Gonzalez. Um, uh, any rate, this, uh, this, this brave uh, individual stepped up to espouse the rights of individuals to have negative information. Um, or perhaps I should qualify that as um, irrelevant 
uh, negative information uh, removed from, from the ability of people to find it on the web. Um, Mr. Costeja had, um, had, had a, a little a property problem at one point a number of years ago, uh, and there was a newspaper article which somehow was deemed so newsworthy that it, it was embedded in the web. And so if you searched his name, you came up with a story about his property problems. Um, and he thought, you know, I dealt with that uh, years ago. It really shouldn't be hanging on. So, so he asked the data protection organization in Spain to, to tell Google to take that information out. And they did. And it then went on appeal to the European Court of Justice, which uh, confirmed or affirmed the, uh, the data privacy ruling that under the EU directive uh, on privacy, uh, this was uh, required that uh, the, uh, the, the data agency uh, needed to de-link or de-index uh, this guy's name and this story so that it wouldn't appear the next time somebody went onto Google or whatever uh, other uh, website and, and tried to find out information about this guy. So naturally, uh, when that happened, uh, there were cheering in the streets by some and uh, moping faces by others uh, about the negative uh, influence of this of this decision. This was going to uh, uh, this was going to prevent libraries from functioning in the future because uh, they wouldn't be able to find any information about anybody or anything. Well, uh, that kind of um, uh, extreme concerns. It uh, doesn't really seem to materialize, but the, but the same uh, expressions of concern continue. Um, uh, the data I've seen is that Google has received a half a million requests to remove information uh, at, over the last uh, three years uh, and has, in fact, complied with 43.2% of them. So that's uh, not quite a quarter of a million uh, bits of information that uh, theoretically is no longer uh, available. Uh, there's, um, figure out how I can do this, yeah, okay. So uh, a couple of things that are, that are trending right now is that the EU, which is where this particular uh, right to be forgotten has really exploded into life, um, they have a new uh, regulation that's going to come online in a year and a half, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, and which continues, despite the hullabaloo about the right to be forgotten, which continues the same basic principles about the right to be forgotten uh, and allow EU citizens to request that information about them, negative information that is no longer uh, deemed newsworthy or appropriate uh, can be removed. Uh, the uh, International Federation of Library Associations, IFLA, uh, is a strong voice urging restraint with respect to the right to be forgotten, saying, well, we're really going to balance these things. Yes, individuals have some privacy rights. On the other hand, everybody else in the world has a right to know what's gone on in the past, and we don't want to eliminate the um, the ability of people to do research and to find out what's, what's been going on historically. Uh, they're focused right now, as are a number of others, on a case that is now before the French High Court, um, the Conseil d'Etat, um, which uh, has been asked to rule on a French uh, Data Privacy Commission ruling that says not not only in France, but everywhere that Google uh, does business, if there's a takedown order, then they have to apply that everywhere in the world, uh, which would include the United States. Um, Google, uh, not surprisingly, is a little um, put out about this. So they are uh, fighting this as hard as they can before the French High Court. So that'll be an interesting one to see. Um, one of the... Um, uh, quotable uh, bites that I saw from one librarian talking about the effect on the U.S. Uh, they said that the odds of the U.S. adopting a right to be forgotten are close to zero. Um, 
I'm not uh, sure, so sure that that's true. Um, there are certainly some existing rules that, um, that do allow certain kinds of uh, information to be removed from the public record, so to speak. Uh, but, um, but it's not as strong a legislative base to build on as in Europe. So this is, this is an area to keep, um, keep in mind or, um, as we say, uh, not forget. <laughs> oh, wrong button, sorry. There we go. Okay, so turning from the right to be forgotten to the right to access uh, for uh, uh, individuals with disabilities. Uh, a couple of months ago, the University of California at Berkeley uh, received a letter from the Department of Justice uh, announcing that they had found that Berkeley was in violation of the Americans with oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> so sorry, sit up. Okay, your your turn. There will be questions later. Um, so they uh, they uh, Ber Berkeley got this letter from the Department of Justice, which said that you're in violation of the Americans with Disability Acts, Title II thereof, uh, for uh, failing to give proper access to the handicapped, uh, particularly those with uh, visual and audio um, uh, problems, to their online uh, open access um, courses. Uh, you could go uh, on YouTube, you could go on iTunes, and you could um, go through the internet and get uh, a MOOC, uh, a massive open online course, right? MOOC? Yep, okay. Um, and you never outgrow your need for MOOC. Um, <laughs> so uh, the uh, university was uh, in all good faith and thinking that they were doing the great and noble thing, making the, the, all of their courses, not maybe all, but many, many, many of their courses available through uh, digital recordings and things through YouTube and the, um, uh, and the internet. And the, and the government said, oh, well, you know, that's all well and good, but um, if you're blind, you can't take advantage of this. And if you can't hear, well, you can't uh, take advantage of, of listening to this. So um, uh, we're going to order you to change all these things so that they will be available to all citizens uh, who have disabilities. Uh, related to this. Um, and the university's response uh, was, um, huh, you know, no good deed goes unpublished. Uh, <laughs> so um, so they, they said, well, you know, we're going to look into this. And, um, but, you know, our reaction right now is um, this is going to cost a fortune. And we have, like, no budget. I mean, one of the reasons that they were doing this for free was because they couldn't get money for doing this. Uh, it, it wasn't commercially viable, so they weren't able to make money the way they could from giving people a degree and whatever they would take a degree in at the university. So there's no uh, kind of, uh, of, of money flowing through to pay for anything, and they justifiably felt we're not going to be able to take money that would otherwise have to go to, to degree-seeking students in order to run these free programs. So we're going to have to figure out how we can do this, if at all, and whether the government is going to be at all flexible in this and work with us. So right now, we're still in, a, in an unknown state, but the great fear is that this will put an end to... Uh, all the kind of free programming that, that Berkeley was making available, and by inference, uh, by analogy, to any university anywhere that opens uh, itself, uh, its course catalogs up to this kind of free education without making it available to all those who can't see, those who can't hear. Those are certainly justifiable and, and worthy ends, but trying to balance all this is not an easy thing. So that's something to watch as well. 
So uh, let me now turn to the Georgia State case. Um, and we've talked about this uh, a couple of times in the past, and I've statused you uh, on it. Let's see, uh, you, okay, everybody's here. This is your turn now. So Georgia State is uh, uh, not unusual, uh, I would say, in, in having uh, a program where professors can specify the readings that students must do for the classes uh, and to put the materials on reserve. Now, it used to be that the teacher would say, okay, you got to read 20 pages from the Smith and Jones book and we're going to put that at the library and you go down to the library and you can check it out for two hours, um, fall asleep and then bring it back and then realize <laughs> Oh, I, damn, I didn't read the book. Um, so in order to make this whole process easier, as it's been recognized, uh, technology has moved along, they have electronic reserves. So they can um, copy a book or a portion of a book and uh, turn it into a digital copy, which they can allow students to access uh, online uh, for their readings. or they make electronic course packets. Now, lots of schools for years have done electronic, uh, excuse me, hard copy course packets where the teacher would say, okay, I want 10, 10 pages from this book, 20 pages from this one, 100 pages from that one, blah, blah, blah. It all gets, gets photocopied uh, and bound into a course packet book, which you can go and buy at the, at the university bookstore. And for those many, many uh, times, uh, the uh, Copyright Clearance Center uh, or some other mechanism is used by the university or the professors to get permission to publish those in hard copy. Well, there's mechanisms to do this electronically as well, but somehow um, it's become viewed by the university, some universities and some professors as too much trouble to, to do this, to get these permissions, and it costs money, and isn't it just better if we just photocopy this stuff and scan it and digitize it and make it available, and then we can cut out the whole middleman called the publisher. So um, this, not surprisingly, has, uh, has caused uh, a negative reaction among publishers. Uh, and that has been become visible in lawsuits like the Georgia State case, uh, where um, in, in uh, excuse me 2011, the um, uh, group of publishers brought suit against the university and named like the board of regents and the president and everybody else from Georgia State as parties in this uh, copyright infringement because they said that there were 6,700 works um, that were being photocopied in part or in whole uh, and used in some 600 courses. So this was massive copyright infringement from the publisher's point of view. So the case goes to trial and um, it, it all got weird when it got into court as uh, so often is the case. And and it ended up that, that the case was all about like a hundred books and a hundred examples of, uh, of copying. And, and what the court ended up doing, the trial court, was sort of establishing some rules of thumb, kind of being a little overwhelmed by the volume here, uh, was quite grateful that it was only down to 99 and not 6,700 books, and imposed some kind of rules of thumb which was the principal one being that if, if less than 10% um, or no more than one chapter of a book was used, then it was fair use. And the case goes on appeal. The publishers thought, well, that's, we don't really like that rule. Uh, in fact, we don't like the way the court did this at all. So we're going to take this whole thing up on appeal. But they took it to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals in Atlanta. And the 11th Circuit, um, somewhat ponderously uh, went through in, in 2014, reversed the trial court 
really on a theory that, well, the trial court really didn't exactly do the fair use analysis correctly, so we're going to send it back, but didn't really chastise the court for, for a number of its theories. It said, well, this 10% this or one chapter rule, that's kind of mechanistic. I mean, maybe that would be okay in particular cases, but we're going to send it back for the court to look at again. And so uh, that was 2014. In March of this year, the case came back uh, from, from the district court. And basically, the court duplicated its prior opinion. Um, it, um, it, you know, it uh, copied itself, which I, I guess wasn't really a copyright violation of its own opinion. But they, they, they said, well, OK, I'm going to think about it. And so we're going to think about each of these things. And we're going to balance it the way. That, and I'm balancing in my mind each of these things the way the court uh, of appeals said. But they came out to basically the same same ruling that there was like four instances where there was too much taken. You know, it was more than 10%. It was more than a chapter. And in those situations, that was a copyright violation. But because the other 95 instances were fair use, the court, uh, this court said, well, the university has won and we're going to award like two and a half million dollars worth of legal fees uh, to the university for having to go to the trouble of defending itself uh, against these accusations. Uh, will that case get taken up on appeal to the 11th Circuit? I would certainly think so. So we haven't heard the end of it. Um, it's the two-year locust. It comes back every two years <laughs> for a report here. Um, but it's obviously an, an issue of enormous significance because from the publisher's point of view, they say, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute, how can this be happening? This is like a child talking when these courts look at this stuff. You know, we're in the business of getting writers to publish things uh, or to present things to us. We publish them. And the whole system works with this thing called money where we pay, not much, but we pay authors. And then we get money, not much. Uh, and we get money, and that, that, you know, so we give some of that to the authors, and then we spend some on the printing, and, you know, and in the end, um, we line our pockets with pennies. So um, the, the, whole, the whole process collapses, it falls down um, if, the, um, if, if anyone, particularly those that are our target audience, I mean, these are books for academics and academic uses, and if nobody has to pay for this, is they don't want the whole book, they just want to take half of it or a quarter of it or 10% of it. How are we going to make it? How's this whole thing going to work? So the uh, publishers generally think that they're not being heard. Um, the uh, ecosystem, as they say, is, uh, is being undercut. Um, so there are some similar cases that are going on in other, in other places in the United States and abroad. Uh, and in particular, for example, uh, just a month or so ago in, uh, in Delhi, India, and I, I'm, someone will need to remind me, I can't remember the difference between Delhi and New Delhi. I think they're two different places, but maybe they're connected. Right. Anyway, they're, they're near each other, right? So um, in any event, uh, Delhi University had this arrangement with a photocopy shop. And they said, OK, we're going to channel you um, all these books, and you photocopy them and put them into course packets. Now, in the United States, even under the 11th Circuit ruling and under the district court ruling, it's almost sure that that would be a copyright violation if a photocopy shop made physical copies. Somehow, magically, it's not transformative, but it's different if it's electronic. But if you're making paper copies and it's a photocopy shop and you're doing it for commercial purposes, that would be, oh, I'm sorry, this is now your group. Um, <laughs> so um, this, would be, this would be a problem uh, in the United States for the photocopy shop, because they're charging money to make copies and deliver them to, to students. Um, but that nuance um, didn't, didn't really seem to appeal to the court, this is a trial court uh, in Delhi, and the, the court said that, no, no, this is actually all for you know, nonprofit 
purposes. It's it's for students, and students don't have a lot of money, and uh, you know, and, and the publishers have a lot of money, and so the students shouldn't have to pay for the books. And in this case, they were actually, in some cases, like photocopying the whole book. So, the the fair use doctrine, which actually is embedded in in Indian copyright law, just like it is in the United States, of course, says fair use is if it's a university and it's for students studying, you can copy the whole thing and you can do it in hard copy, you can do it electronically, you can do it wherever way you want to, but it's, it's fair use because it's for this public purpose, for this nonprofit educational purpose. That's a kind of extreme interpretation <coughs> excuse me of this uh, uh, of this kind of kind of rule that uh, that you know if there is this educational exemption in, in, in you know, US law and things but going too far like this is as we say going too far so um, we're gonna see whether this is on appeal I got a hold of a friend of mine who's a, a lawyer and uh, in India, and I said, well, this is going to be appealed, and he says, oh, yes, oh, yes, this judge is reversed all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I don't know whether it's on copyright cases or what, but anyway, he seemed quite confident it was going to get reversed, which may be comfortable uh, or comforting to the, uh, to the publishers who are involved. But in any event, it's a, uh, it's a fascinating um, fight that's going on right now, and you can see both sides to it. Um, uh, but it, it does seem, you know, you take a step back and you say, wait a minute, copying hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books, that's okay? Well, of course, we had the whole thing with Google Books and we had the whole thing with Hathi Trust and, oh, well, that's okay over there, but maybe it's not okay over there. So anyway, this gives us something to talk about every year. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, last, uh, I, I move on now uh, for, for my annual song for you all. And um, so uh, this is going to be a little different. Um, you're all going to actually have to help me here uh, because this is going to be a, uh, a rap song, or maybe it's a hip hop. I don't know the difference between hip hop and rap. <laughs> so we gotta go, here we go. Here's a little story that I got to tell about three publishers that done went through hell. They started off a sue in old Georgia State, hoping they would win before a magistrate. They said the college has been acting criminally by making packets that are looking too similarly. Instead of buying books or paying for our rights, they're ripping off the bread for my boys who write. Hang on now. Keep going. The school says, hey, you're always just being fair, using up some words a chapter here and there. The judge says, yeah, I dig from where you came, because you are in the nonprofit education game. You didn't use too much of what those authors say, and them publishers aren't losing too much anyway. So put it on reserve on a hard drive or a floppy. You are good to go to take the books and copy. <laughs> now we go for the big, big finish here. Whoa, who? You copying me? You, 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 you copying me? Whoa, who? You copying me? You, 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 you copying me? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> my, uh, my performance will be available on iTunes. <laughs> Well, we're just about almost out of time. I have to tell you about Bill, though. He is amazing. He, uh, as you know, graduated from Yale Law School. And last year, this year, they had their X number reunion. We won't say which one. And uh, yes. they staged a, a play, a sort of operetta play. And Bill wrote for an hour, hour and a half of production the uh, lyrics and the songs. So we have a genuine talent here. <laughs> oh, uh, 
October wants to know if that's on YouTube. No, but the, uh, but the DVD is available. <laughs> $20 plus $3 shipping and handling. Yeah, we bought one. It was worth it. Do you have a question? I have a short comment and a question for Bill. My comment is that I got my check two weeks ago from the Copyright Clearance Center in the amount of $2,121. Uh, this is swell, but there are two problems with it. One is I haven't had a check for several years. Number two, even though the same content is out there and presumably the similar use. But second, the Copyright Clearance Center does not give me any slightest clue why it is giving me this money or what it's for or what use has been made. And I think that's bizarre. I think it represents a showing of disrespect for authors um, to hand us our dribble, hand us our pittance, 2100 is not a pittance, but it's, I'm not retiring on it either, uh, but not to share the information about what's going on. I think it's also a marketing problem for CCC because I don't feel, I feel if anything less closely bonded to the system after I get my money than before, and I don't think that's what they want. Bill, for the Georgia State case, what will it take in the abstract to get to resolution on this. If the 11th Circuit finally says, basta, done, over, and it doesn't get taken up by the Supremes, does that become the law of the land, or does it continue to compete out in the other places? Well, the, um, what the court has actually said, both the 11th Circuit and the district court, is, is with respect to any given use of copyrighted material, it depends whether or not it's a infringement that is uh, protected by fair use or not is, must be judged on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, which creates an enormous burden on all of the parties uh, in a situation. And um, I think what's needed is judicious uh, self-control and a recognition on the part of universities uh, that they need to be as protective of the ecosystem, uh, as one of the publishers said, uh, of, of publishing and writing. And the publishers have to recognize that there's, there's some rights on the, uh, of fair use and for public university, non-public, um, <coughs> excuse me, non-profit uh, institutions. So I think there's going to have to be a resolution at the uh, practical human level as opposed to some legal rule that's going to clearly say, oh, 5%, <coughs> half a chapter, whatever. I don't, think, I don't think that's going to happen. Certainly Congress is not going to come through and say we're going to answer this. I could reply on the CCC thing. I, I think what's probably happened is that they've got some foreign revenues uh, so what happens to the CCC is that <clears throat> sometimes the foreign ROs will kind of divert funds to the CCC for quote-unquote American authors and publishers, <clears throat> but the, they often do that without any uh, information about the actual copying activity. Uh, so typically I think what the CCC would be doing is they'd be looking at <clears throat> kind of similar uh, uh, distributions that they would do uh, within the states and then dividing up the revenue in some fashion. But I agree with you, they could be more transparent about it. Well, I believe we've run out of time, so I invite you to join us next year to hear more about these cases and other improbable ones. Uh, and until then, join me in thanking our speakers.